Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the, uh, the reproach of famine among the nations. And then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord. Let it be known to you. You know, that is, that's, that right there is good news. We read that, and it's like, what do you mean not for my sake? Our salvation is predicated upon his name's sake, which he is in the uh, business of glorifying his name. He will be faithful to glorify his name. And so your salvation is wrapped up in the glorification of his name. So that's really good news, that he's not doing it for you, that your salvation rests upon his name being glorified, and his name will be glorified. Amen? So so will your salvation. Nor for your sake do I do this, says the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God. Now this, I want you to listen to this because this is a sub-sermon within my sermon. On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. Can I get an amen from somebody there? The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. And then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. So we see here that there is a promise. Now, like I said, I think that this is for some people. You need to hear this. You may feel like that you're going through the valley of dryness. You're sitting and surrounded by dry bones. The Lord has promised that he will make the desolate land look like the Garden of Eden. So those dry and arid places in your life, God is replanting, rebuilding, reestablishing, amen, and building you up in his glory each and every day. He will be faithful to do it. Hallelujah. The verse that I want to focus on this morning out of all of that is verse 26. Let's read it again. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Definition of a stony heart, it's a heart that is hard, it is calloused, it is insensible, it is inflexible, it is unmoved by the majesty and the splendor of God, it is unable to appreciate the blessing that is given through a new life with Christ, it is unmoved and will not respond to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is a stony heart. It is one that has distanced itself from the glory of God. We have exchanged the things of the earth for the things or for the things of heaven for the things of the earth that we have substituted within our hearts and filled ourselves with fleshly things and this has caused our heart to become calloused and wandered away from the Lord. There are three types of, un- of calloused, stony hearts. First, there's the unregenerated heart. Unregenerated heart. A heart that has not experienced the life-changing power of the gospel. You talk to your friends. Maybe there are some here. You wonder why you feel dead inside? Because you are. You wonder why there's a gaping hole right in the middle of your gut each and every day that you can find no joy, you can find no happiness. It's because your heart has not been renewed. Now, as I look across the crowd here today, I hope that everybody has been regenerated. I know most of you are. So uh, I'm just praying that if you haven't been, that you come to that place today. But for your friends, when they come to you and they can't find any life, they can't find any happiness, you have the answer, and his name is Jesus Christ. A regenerated heart 
takes the stone away from it, the callousness away from it, and replaces it. As Jesus says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll take this heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Why is the world running around trying to consume everything that they can? Because they're trying to fill the gaping hole that's right in the middle of their chest that God only can fill. The second type of stony heart is a regenerated heart. Okay, so a heart that has experienced the gospel, the born-again experience has happened, the miracle of Jesus becoming the Lord of your life has taken place. It's a regenerated heart that has become calloused to the things of God. Jesus gave us a description of this heart in Matthew 15, 8 through 10, where he said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as the doctrines, the commandments of men. Now, he was speaking to the religious leaders when he said that the pastors of the day, he was calling them out and said, these people come to me and they sing the pretty songs. They say that they're Christians. They say that they worship God. They make a big deal of their religious mindset, but yet their hearts are nowhere even close to me. They don't know me. In vain, they worship me. It is a heart that is no longer moved by the majesty and the splendor of God. It is a heart that hears the word of God but refuses to apply it to their lives. It is a heart that has become unimpressed with the things of God. I don't want this to be a generalization because some people just might be reserved, but I can tell you as a worship leader whose heart is callous and whose heart is not when I begin to lead worship. That as I look out upon a congregation and if there is no move, if there is no change in their faces, there is no exhortation coming from the bottom of their hearts, your heart is calloused. If you aren't moved by the presence of God, you are in some way disconnected from His glory. We've turned our worship times into space fillers. How do I know that? Because most people don't get to church until 1045. Worship started at 10.30, yet we roll in at 10.45 and 11 o'clock. I wonder if we would show up on time if Jesus had a time card standing right at the side of that door right there. The king of the universe, and yet we can't make it here on time. We have become calloused, unmoved by the glory of God. Because I'll tell you what, if I told you next week that Jesus would be preaching, I bet you you'd be here on time. Jesus is here, church. If you don't feel him, it's because you've become disconnected. The church today is in major trouble because we have made everything about us. Well, they don't play my type of songs. He doesn't preach my type of word. I just don't get my needs met there. If we go back to the Old Testament, people made journeys from miles and miles and miles and miles and brought their most expensive fatted calf and presented it unto God for it to be slain as an act of worship unto God. They didn't travel miles and miles and miles because the pastor was going to love them and take care of them. They traveled miles and miles and miles because they had to get to the house of the Lord to bring honor unto the name of God. Our hearts become callous when we become inward focused. When everything becomes about us and not about Him. Third type of stony heart is a heart that may draw near to God, may seek His glory, may apply the Word to their lives, but because of past hurts, this heart guards itself from being hurt ever again at all costs. So you close yourself off to the very blessings of fellowship, the very blessings of companionship that God has intended for you to enjoy. And so therefore the life of God is being sucked out of your heart. But yet you're guarding it because you think it's going to keep you secure and safe and healthy when actually it's robbing you from the joys of life. It's another type of stony heart. God, Jesus has promised that he will give you a new heart. 
heart of flesh. What is a heart of flesh? Well, to, in order to uh, define it, I went to Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, because I thought it captured all of it. And let me read that to you. A heart of flesh. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Everybody say, draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, hence the church, as in the manner of some. It's like he's writing this today. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is the definition of a heart of flesh, one that hungers for God, one that draws near to God, one that allows God to permeate every part of his being and change him and mold him. As it says that we are uh, sprinkled, our hearts are sprinkled from evil conscience, but also we've been washed with pure water. What does that mean? We've been baptized into his death and brought up in his resurrection. Therefore, we live differently than we did before, that there's a pureness that's coming. There's a righteousness that's happening. There is something that's taking place on the inside of us because our hearts are so hungry for the Lord God Almighty. Church, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful that we don't allow our hearts to become callous to the things of God. That we don't become so inwardly focused that we forget that we live to bring glory to his name. Turn with me, if you would, to John 12. We're going to take a a look at a story that I think highlights the characteristics of these two different hearts and will lead us into the the why it is so important to not allow your heart to become callous or stony and and how you keep that from happening. John 12, it is interesting that these two things are wrapped up together because you have the extreme opposites happening in the same room. We understand this is as Jesus was about to head to the cross. Lazarus was just raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And in John 12, we have the story of the anointing by Mary at Bethany. And it says in verse 1, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus who uh, was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and another book says, and her tears. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. We see Mary with the heart of flesh and her reaction towards Christ. And we see Judas on the opposite side end of the spectrum with a stony heart, a calloused heart. I mean, let's not forget that Judas had been called by him. And when he said, come and follow me, Judas signed up. Judas walked with him day after day, night after night, saw the miracles of God, saw the salvation of God. Right before his eyes was a witness, an eyewitness to all that Christ was doing. And yet over the three years, his heart had turned from a heart of flesh into a heart of stone to the point where he would ultimately forsake Christ and turn him over to be killed. We have the two different hearts happening and the distinctions between them could not be greater. Let's look at some characteristics of Judas's stony heart. First and foremost, it is unmoved and it is unimpressed by the miracles of God. Unmoved and unimpressed by the miracles of God. Well, how do you get that out of that scripture there, Pastor? And well, let's not forget, Lazarus is chilling at the table. 
not half a book earlier, Jesus cried out and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he did. But yet here's Lazarus or Judas unmoved by the fact that the homeboy that was dead is now sitting at the table and is upset because some woman is worshiping Jesus with all that he is, with all that she is. He is no longer moved by the power of God. Do our hearts, have they become so removed from him that we are no longer impressed by the beauty of his glory? That we are no longer impressed by the greatest miracle that's ever taken place, which is your salvation. Going back to worship for a moment, people coming into church, well, I ain't got nothing to worship for today, man. It's been a hard week. I'm just going to sit here like this and let God know I'm mad because he ain't, he ain't taking care of me like he should. You've been born again, sweetheart. He's called you out of the depths of the miry clay and has rescued you. There is enough to praise God over from here until eternity ends and expires. We can never run out of words to say to express our thanks for his salvation in our lives. Quit looking at all that you don't have and begin to focus on the immense amount of blessings that he has poured upon your life. When you begin to live life out of a place where you say, you know what, God, you just haven't given enough for me. Your heart's on its way to being callous. You are no longer impressed by the miracle of rebirth that has happened in your life. I mean, we might freak out today if somebody brought a coffin in and and God raised this person up out of the grave. We'd be rejoicing, having revival. This church probably packed next week. But yet we have hundreds of people walk in this place every day that have been brought back from the dead, and yet we can't get anybody to sing with us. Number two, so we have first, it's unmoved and unimpressed by the miracles of God. Number two, it veils itself, a stony heart veils itself and the sin within it with a cloak of self-righteousness. A stony heart feels like that it has to talk about all that it's done. It's religiosity. It's self-righteousness. What was the first thing that he tried to say? Why couldn't we give this money to the poor? Judas is like, look how righteous I am, man. Let's not waste it on the feet of Jesus. Let's give it to the poor. He was veiling his own deception within his heart. He was a thief. He didn't care about the poor. The word says it right there. He was robbing from the kingdom of God. He was veiling his deceit. He was veiling his stony heart by trying to make himself seem self-righteous, promoting his own ability, his own ideas over God's ideas. Amen. I mean, here's the king of the universe. We should have all joined in. All of them should have jumped down at his feet and joined in with Mary saying, praise be to God. See, in our own personal lives, when we we begin to tell people how righteous we are, we need to be concerned about the state of our heart because I'll tell you this. Salvation comes from one place alone, and that is only a gift from the hand of God. He is the only one that can change you. He is the only one that can deliver you. It has nothing to do with you, not your ability, not your ways, not how great you are. So quit touting your spiritual horn. And get at the feet of Jesus and begin to say, thank you for saving me, the sinner that I am, oh God. Because without you, I'm broken, I'm lost, I can't do anything. But with you, Father, I've been redeemed and made righteous, been lifted up, hallelujah. I'll worship at your feet from here until eternity, praise God. There is not enough words to say, oh Lord. But it veils itself and the sin within it with a cloak of self-righteousness. Humble yourself before the Lord. Fall at his feet. Be desperate for him. Don't be afraid to talk to some brother or sister about what you're struggling with. Because trust me, if they open up their closet even that much, there's going to come a whole bunch of bones falling out. We are all in desperate need of the hand of Jesus in our lives. No one has made it. We are all on a journey together. Amen? Number three. A stony heart becomes indignant, upset, bothered at the sight of extravagant worship. Remember when David brought the ark back into its rightful place and he was dancing before the Lord and his wife got mad at him? It's like, oh, did you see the king there today dancing around in his underwear like a fool? You impressed everybody today. He sent her away, man. That was it. She was out. Never called for her again. 
Well, he danced before the Lord with all of his might, extravagant worship. And the person who had a stony heart, their heart was turned, and they became indignant and upset. And she couldn't stand looking at her husband, looking like such an idiot. But yet, if she would realize the glory of God, she would have joined in with him and began to dance. Number four, a stony heart is a heart that is callous to the glory of God. Judas had lost sight of Jesus' lordship at some point, that he knew better than Jesus. Part of me wonders if he was trying to help Jesus in some type of self-deception, that he thought Jesus had kind of lost his mind and was, was like, okay, this has gone too far. I don't really believe what you're saying. We've got to stop this thing. We've got to bring it into it. I don't know. All I know is his heart turned cold and callous toward the glory of God. Some point down the road, he lost touch with how magnificent God is. Number five, a stony heart is bent towards rebellion against the ways of God. He forsake Jesus. There was rebellion in his heart. And within a heart of stone, there is rebellion that lives rampantly and wants to run away from the ways of God. It looks for complete and total autonomy, no accountability. It looks to seek its own ways above every other way. It is bent towards rebellion against the ways of God. Now we have on the other side, we have Mary who demonstrates a heart of flesh. Let's look at some of those characteristics. First and foremost, a heart of flesh is bent towards personal, costly sacrifice all to be sent, spent on the glory of God. Now let's remember, this, mar- this, this oil that she poured out upon his feet was very costly. It cost her an expense, an ex- an ex- uh, a lot of money. <laughs> That's all right. Cost her a lot of money to pour out that oil that day. There was a personal sacrifice involved. A heart of flesh lives a life of costly sacrifice before the Lord, is willing to take their alabaster box of oil that they saved up and earned that cost them so much and pour it about freely upon the feet of Jesus whenever he asks or whenever he uh, leads us to. That in our obedience, there is a cost that, takes, that happens within our hearts. But a, a heart of flesh says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. It looks to do the ways of the kingdom. It is ever attentive and has its eyes focused on Jesus, ready to spend all upon him. Number two, a heart of flesh is attentive to the needs of the kingdom. A heart of flesh is attentive to the needs of the kingdom. What was she doing here? She was anointing Jesus for his burial, for his death. In his moment of need, as he was entering into one of the most difficult periods of his fleshly life here on this earth, she was the only one that took notice of what he was struggling with and brought him some comfort and some joy and strength into his life. She was attentive to the needs of the kingdom. Here we have Martha, who is busy serving, making dinner. And we know in another context, Martha and Mary kind of go at it. And Martha's like, hey, man, tell Mary to get up and to help me serve and to get things together. And I heard this great pastor say that as Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, if he said, I'm thirsty, do you not think that she would have instantly jumped up and ran and got him something to drink? Martha was concerned with the things that she was imposing upon herself in religiosity. Mary was at the feet of Jesus, attentive to the needs of the kingdom. What do you need, Lord? What a different life we would lead if we woke up every morning saying, what do you need done? Rather than presenting our list of what we needed done every day. Number three, a heart of flesh lives at the feet of Jesus in complete surrender and dependence upon him. Where does it say here? It says, she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And with her tears, a more humble sight, I cannot imagine. She surrendered all to him. She lived at his feet. A heart of flesh, number four, worships extravagantly. Look at this worship here. It blows my mind. She fell at his feet. 
crying, worshiping him, pouring out fragrant oil upon his feet, anointing them, wiping her tears with her hair. She wasn't worried about what Judas thought. I wonder if when Judas piped up, it was like, we thought you would say something. She didn't care. She didn't care about Martha being busy with all this other stuff. She didn't care about what the religiosity people might think. She didn't care about any of that. She cared about Christ alone and was willing to look foolish in her worship for him. Church, we should be a people that worship extravagantly. For crying out loud, the name of our church is Life Song. It's in the title. I planted it because I, expect, I had visions of worship that took the roof off the place. We have to come primed and ready to worship together. That we as a people have been spending time at his feet so that when we come together corporately, there's not any transition, there's not any awkwardness. It's just an overflow of all of our personal worship times. And we instantly come into his presence and we are lifted up in his glory much quicker, much faster. Why? Because I'm, we aren't having to beg everyone and to pump you up. You know, let me get out the bicycle pump. <laughs> now you guys are all waving in the wind with the van. Now let's skip the whole pump up process. Come in ready to wave in the wind with the van. Come on now. Our worship, man, our deepest times of worship should not be at church. They should be behind closed doors. I should be in place of just me and him, man. Nobody's up there leading a song. And I have Pastor Aaron yelling at me about singing louder and all this stuff. It's just me and Jesus. And the deeper that our personal worship goes as a church, as a people, the deeper our church, our worship will go here on Sundays. So it worships extravagantly. Number five, a heart of flesh. I love this one. A heart of flesh fills the atmosphere with the fragrance of Christ Jesus. What happened here is she poured this oil out upon his feet. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, with the fragrance of the anointing. Because that's what she was doing. She was anointing him with oil in the same way that Samuel anointed David as king and poured that oil over his head and it washed down over his beard was a signification that he had been chosen as king and that God's anointing was upon him to be king. She was anointing him and this anointing, the fragrance of it, filled the entire house. A heart of flesh, wherever it goes, fills the atmosphere with the anointing of God. It fills the atmosphere with his presence, with his strength, with his glory. Amen. It is not driven to and fro by the ways of this world. It is not double-minded. No, it comes in and changes the very atmosphere. That what is on the inside eventually comes to the outside. Hallelujah. So a heart of flesh fills the atmosphere with the fragrance of Christ. Why is it so important for us to make sure that our hearts don't get calloused? Because, as in the same way that Judas' heart was calloused, Judas was found hanging on a tree in the field of blood. He had killed himself. His calloused heart led him to death. Your calloused heart will lead you to death. It will. It absolutely will. And you may be born again. You might be walking with the Lord. But if your heart becomes calloused, you will find death. As for Mary, she was filled with his life. Filled with his glory. I wrote down some scriptures here that give you some promises of what it is to have a heart of flesh that is constantly being renewed. Just again, reemphasizing the importance of making sure, taking check of your heart this morning. Proverbs 15, 13. I'm going to read through these pretty quickly. So if you just want to write down the references so you can go back and look at them, that would be beneficial to you. Proverbs 15, 13 says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. A heart of flesh makes a cheerful countenance. If you have no joy, you need to begin to inspect your heart. If you're depressed, you need to expect your heart. 
If you've got no peace, inspect your heart because the word of God says that a merry heart, a heart of flesh that takes joy in God, in other words, makes a cheerful countenance, but by the sorrow of the heart, what? The spirit is broken. Proverbs 14.33. Proverbs 14.33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of a fool's is made known. When we are connected to God, our heart is filled with wisdom. He gives wisdom liberally. Amen. That's what his word says. The word says that the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. It takes of what is the Father's and declares it unto us. But if your heart is calloused unto God, then you're not hearing from the Spirit, and so therefore you are a fool. (laughs) And what is in the heart of the fool will be made known to everybody. So there's good news for you. All right, Proverbs 23, 7. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the condition of your heart is who you're going to be on the outside. (laughs) Coming to church, we get all cleaned up. We don't want nobody to know what's really going on, do we? That'll find you out. Glory to God. Hope you're with me this morning. 1 Chronicles 16.10, glory in his holy name, and let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. So as your heart is made of flesh, as you seek after him, then you rejoice, amen, that his glory becomes your joy and your strength. 1 Samuel 28.5 says that when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. A heart of stone will be filled with fear. Because at this point in his life, Saul had become callous to the ways of the Lord. And he was afraid, driven to a place. Uh, the king, the man, scared like a child. Isn't it interesting to contrast that with David, who stepped up to the valley where Goliath was and showed no fear? Why? Because he had a heart of flesh. His heart was inclined unto the Lord, unlike Saul's was. So therefore, there was no reason to be afraid. Amen. You struggle with fear? Check your heart. What's in it? Psalms 15, 1 through 2 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. If you're hungry for more of God, if you're wanting to go deeper with him, if you want to walk on the the hill of the holiness in his tabernacle, your heart has to be a heart of flesh. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your hearts. Job 33, 3 says, My words come from my upright heart. (laughs) Yeah. My lips utter pure knowledge. My words come from an upright heart. I've told you this so many times. You want to get an inspection of your heart, inspect what's coming out of your mouth. What do you say? You spewing ugliness all over everybody all the time? Well, then there's ugliness in your heart. You need to cleanse it. You mad at your husband and speaking down to him at all times? You need to cleanse your heart. Husbands, if you're treating your family with verbal abuse and anger and all the time just cynicism and all this junk comes out of your mouth, you need to check your heart. Your heart has become calloused in some area. And see, this is what's so crazy about having a callous heart is it doesn't just start one day by callousing the whole heart. It starts a little bit at a time. You're going to think I'm saying this because I'm a pastor and I want our church to be full. Yes, I do want our church to be full. It starts by saying, eh, we won't go this week. Eh. Eh. Broncos play at 11. Ah, it's too snowy out. But if someone's writing us a paycheck, we're there, baby. Ain't no snow. (laughs) Keep us from doing it, right? What's in our heart? Is it filled with greed? Is it filled with worship? Come on now. Happens a little bit at a time. That indifference to the house of the Lord begins to eke its way through the rest of your body. 
the rest of your heart. And all of a sudden, in some other areas, you become callous. And before you know it, you turn around and you're attending church like once a month. And it's like once every six months. And then all of a sudden, we just don't see you anymore. Ask me how I know. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've seen it. Planning a church checks what's in our heart. Starting at 1030 with seven of us checks what's in your heart. Setting up week after week after week checks what's in your heart. That's why serving at the house of the Lord is so important because it checks what's in your heart. It brings evaluation into your life. So the last thing here I want to share with you before we go is how. How do you get to this place? If you are taking inspection of your heart this morning and you're saying, you know, my heart's not totally callous, but I think that there are some areas that have become callous or some places of indifference that are rising up in my life. Or maybe you're here right now and you're going, you know what? You're right, man. My heart is callous. I don't care about anything. <laughs> I don't care less about the Lord, you know. If that's in your place, God has mercy on you. The Word says that He is greater than our heart. That's what it says in 1 John. Amen. We just read that He promised in Ezekiel to put a new spirit within us, to redeem our lives, to take the desolate places, and to make them full like the Garden of Eden. What a great promise. And so we can come to Him with hearts that are broken, hearts that are desperate, and cry out to Him like the psalmist and say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So the first step into changing your heart is to cry out unto God, become desperate for him. Realize that you need him to change your life. Realize that he only alone has the power to deliver you from a heart of stone. Cry out to God. The next thing is that we need to repent. Nobody talks about repentance anymore, it seems like. We have to repent. What is repent? It means to turn away from that area of sin in your life. In Deuteronomy 10, 16 through 21, it says this, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast fast, and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Repent. Cut the foreskin of your heart off and be stiff naked no longer. Amen. Cry out to God. Repent. Next thing, apply the word. Job 22, 22 says, Receive, please, instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. The Bible says that a man who disregards what the word of the Lord says unto him is like a man who's looking in a mirror and as soon as he walks away from it forgets what he looked like. What does that mean? That means that you read the word and you're all oh, yes and amen. This is good. I need to change some stuff today. And then you put it away and you are walking in the deceit of your own righteousness, your own inflexibility unto the Lord. You forget that he has read your mouth and he has told you to change. If you want to callous your heart, listen to the word and never apply it and you will be successful. If you want to take the stone off of your heart, listen to the word, apply it to your life. Be humble enough to say, God, I struggle in this area. I need you to help me. I don't want to be like the man who looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. I want your word to take inventory of my life and be an actual glory, a reflection of who I really am. So therefore I can change into your presence and into your glory. And the last thing is spend time at the feet of Jesus and worship extravagantly. Let me just ask you this one question, church. When was the last time you turned on a little bit of worship music at your house got everything quieted down, and got before the presence of God. Are you living on the 30 minutes that we give you here every Sunday? 
If you are, you are depleted and malnourished. You need the presence of God in your life to soften your heart continuously. I'm not trying to be theologically correct here, so forgive me if I take some things out of context, but I just found it so interesting that in the chapter before, Jesus comes to raise Lazarus from the dead. And then in verse 38 says, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and what? A stone lay against it. And Jesus said, the first thing that he said, take away the stone. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And then what? They took away the stone. From the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by me, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. And now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Isn't it interesting that before he could do anything, he had to remove the stone? I think the truth, the same is true for the human heart. That there is a man that is waiting behind the stone of your heart to be raised from the dead, to be brought into a place of glory with Christ, to recline at the table with him some days later and enjoy the anointing at Bethany. But the stone has to be removed first. 